Hello, everyone. Uh, there's just a few more people to join. But if you'd like to, in the chat, if you'd like to put your name and where you are today or at the moment. Hello, Ellen and Devon. I was in Devon last week and it was amazing. Arundel, Wolverhampton, wonderful, Newcastle, sunny Surrey, Shrewsbury, Totnes, France, Essex, London, Dartmoor, Ooh, Fulham in London. Fantastic. Um, I'm Anna and I am in Cambridge today. Plymouth, fabulous. Totnes, great. Oh, Christine, you were in Totnes yesterday. Yeah, I was in Totnes last week and it was just wonderful. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we'll make a start and then people can join as they as they come along. Ah, yeah, let me see if we can do that. Um, oh, I love hearing the weather in other places. I love that. Um, Adam, is there any way we could make everyone so that we can all see each other's answers? I'll have a little go here. Ah, yes, that's right. In the chat, if you where it says two next to it, you can select all panelists and attendees and then that should go to everyone. Yeah, so um, I've just seen your question, Doina, and this is a Zoom webinar, so we don't see each other. Um, and so you, you can just see, see me and so no one needs to mute their microphones or anything like that. Hello, Sarah from Newcastle and Liz from Exeter. Um, yes, yeah, so you'll be able to see and hear me. Hello, Caroline. Um, but you don't have to worry about being on mute and you can put things in the chat and chat with each other. And um, OK, so I'm going to begin. So the first thing I want us to do is just to warm up our wrists a little bit. So just really roll the wrists. You can take them up and out. And we're going to be using our hands a lot today and our fingers. And you can imagine you're like the buds of a horse chestnut opening or whatever you feel. And you can reach up and shake the bough of a cherry blossom tree or whatever blossom you feel and have a little shower of, of blossoms. And today we're going to be thinking about spring and exploring it from different angles. And we're going to be a bit mischievous and we're going to be playful. And I don't want you to put any pressure on yourselves whatsoever. I don't want you to feel you've got to get anything right. You know, we're not going to share what we make. We're just going to begin things. And if anything, try and get it wrong. Just play, don't take it too seriously and just enjoy whatever comes along. So the first thing we're going to do, you might need pen and paper for this because we're going to write along with a, a video of beech leaves opening. And one of my favorite things about spring isn't necessarily the buds of flowers opening but it's those lime green tissue paper thin um, leaves that open and they're almost translucent at first and they're like the flowers the first flowers of the year in a way so we're going to write along with the video that I'm going to share in a moment and we're going to do this for a few minutes. So the video will play through and then I'll start it again. 
and hopefully each time you might see different things or you might repeat a line because you see the same thing over and over again. So I'll share now. Okay, so if you're ready, and this is stream of consciousness writing. It doesn't need to make any sense, really just to get us into the zone. So here we are. So have a few moments just to finish the sentence that you're writing. Hi, Justine, Justina, sorry. Um, no worries at all. We've only just started. Don't worry that um, you're late. And I'm sorry that you only just got the link. And um, what we just did was an exercise just to warm ourselves up. So just doing some stream of consciousness writing, but in response to the video of the beech leaves opening. Um, but you haven't missed anything, so don't worry. And welcome. Yeah, so I love watching sped up videos of spring 
because everything feels like it suddenly counters anyway. Everything suddenly shoots up and the colours change overnight. But there's something in watching it sped up. You see how alive things are and the movement and the kind of dance. And spring to me feels like this kind of epic concert where the music just builds and builds and builds over the weeks and months. Um, yeah, so I'm going to share now a quote from Rachel Carson, who some of you might know. She wrote Silent Spring and also um, a sea trilogy, three books around, around the sea. And to me, she's just one of our, one of the greatest writers. She evokes the natural world as if you're in it and next to it and with it. So this is a quote that I wanted to share as a kind of welcome quote. Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. There is something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature. The assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after winter. I'm going to say that again. Those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength, strength that will endure as long as life lasts. There is something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature. The assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after winter. So what that quote makes me think of is kind of before we had calendars and dates and you know these things that we made up as a, as a species when the shifts in the year were our calendar and in many countries and cultures, this is actually the start of the year. You know, it's Persian New Year. And um, so I want us, if we can, to go back to that kind of ancient part of ourselves that doesn't have like the, the box squares of the calendar and tells, you know, Thoreau could tell the time of the day by which flowers were open when. And in Kurdish culture, your kind of birth date isn't necessarily a date. It's when the berries were darkening or the grapes were darkening on the vine or it's at what cycle of the moon it was. And so I want us to tune into that a little bit. And at the moment, I think we're about three days away from the next full moon. And it's our first super moon of the year. There's one in April and then there's one in May. And the moons have so many different languages in different cultures. It is the pink moon, Sarah. And um, it's the pink moon, not because it's pink when it rises or sets, but because of a flower, a tiny flower. So the huge moon this month is named after flocks. And in Japan, they have a festival. They don't only have the cherry blossom festivals, but they also have moss flocks festival. And I'm going to share with you now uh, a picture of the flocks. So we'll get rid of this. So here it is, kind of makes me gasp when I see it. And, um, and this is around this time that, that people go and see the flocks. And there's two stories that I have in my mind that are both true stories. And they feel to me almost like myths and or folk tales. 
And one of the stories um, was through a family friend and his wife had gone into hospital. And this time of year was their her favorite time of year. And outside of their living room was a cherry blossom tree. And this husband was so worried about his wife missing the cherry blossoms that he tied bags around the end of every branch so that the wind wouldn't blow them away before she came out of hospital. And the other story that it makes me think of is um, a story about two farmers, dairy farmers in Japan, uh, husband and wife, and the man's wife went blind and it happened quite suddenly and it sunk her into a melancholy, depression. She didn't go out very much. And so in on their farm, he started to plant flocks and he planted them for about two years so that she could enjoy the scent of it. And I think the spring flowers have the most beguiling scent, hyacinths, bluebells, daffodils, narcissi, because it's still a relative time of darkness. A lot of the flowers that bloom now attract moths and nighttime insects, and that's done through scent rather than color. And I just want to show you a picture of the husband and wife. So there they are, and this is what he planted. And now people from all over come and visit their garden and their farm. And one of the things that we'll explore a little bit today is how we can get contrast and feel like we can write something original about spring. And I also have in my mind that it may be spring in some places, but in other places it's winter. And I want us to see if we can get that balance of light and shadow of, of, of darkness and um, yeah, the kind of joys of spring but we're going to write something in a moment. And spring for a lot of people is a time of new life and sunshine and warmth. But I want us to like up the drama in what we're going to write. So I want us to write with a really contrasting emotion. And I'm going to share two poems with you and then we'll do some more writing ourselves. So, so the first poem is about horse chestnut trees and they have very kind of sticky buds and then they burst out like, thing, you know, they've got almost like five fingers and they are the candelabra tree. They're the one that have that wonderful white kind of candlestick but also spring has a slightly fruity feel to it and this poem I think touches on that um, the kind of fecund fertility flirtatiousness of spring so this is horse chestnut and it's by a poet called Matt Howard who lives in the east of England and works for the RSPB Horse chestnut. In rude health, almost obscene, this full leaf, wet look, already lit with hundreds of candles, spikes of pinkish white flower, all bursting from a yellowy basal blaze. It's only early May. But this unstressed spread and shade forsakes nothing at the roadside. Standing trunk centred, through swirls the wind in heat, hankering for gusts of rain, for nut heaviness, 
to bleed canker and no leaf scars. And then this is an extract from Philip Larkin's The Trees. The trees are coming into leaf, like something almost being said. The recent buds relax and spread. Their greenness is a kind of grief. So what I find so startling there is both writers have done something very specific to them, very personal, and it becomes more poignant because we think of spring as a time of new life. But then in the Philip Larkin, you've got actually the greenness is a kind of grief and you've got that tension and that unexpectedness. And so what I would like you to do, I'm going to give you a, a choice, but equally, if, some, if you want to write something else, just run with it. But I'd like you to write about the budding of leaves, the opening of trees, but with a sense of loss or grief, just the opposite of what you'd normally think, try and go there. Or you can write about the spring in a raunchy way, uh, as if it was a burlesque show. I think of like the ferns and the, like the feathers of a burlesque show. So go in either direction. And I'm going to give us about 10 minutes to do this. And in the background, I'll put on some videos of spring, just in case you need some inspiration. But yes, yeah, so we've got about 10 minutes to do this. Um, so at 2.30, we'll come back together.
So if you could just finish off what you're writing. And if you want to, in the chat, you could share maybe what emotion or feeling, if you did the kind of contrast like Philip Larkin did with, with grief, or if you did the more raunchy, flirty spring, you can say that in the chat too. Fabulous. I'm going to I'm going to share a poem with you from a contemporary poet and then a journal entry from Dorothy Wordsworth, which was written in 1802 in the Lake District in the north of England. But this first poem is by um, a Samoan poet who lives in American Samoa, one of the Pacific Islands, and she is called Sia Figiel. And at the end of the workshop, I'm going to share a link in the chat to her reading this poem. And I love answering back. And we're going to be bold today. And we're going to write with confidence. And if we want to take on the greats, we can and we will. So this um, is the daffodils from a native's perspective. Apologies, Mr. Wordsworth. But I too wandered lonely as a cloud. When I first heard your little poem, Form 3, Literature Class, that floats on high over vales and hills. She made us memorize you, along with tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of your other 19th century romantic friends. When all at once she'd pull my ear each time I started at the Alice bush next to the mango tree outside. But in the end, I became quite the expert on your golden host of daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing under the pilau trees. After school, singing, singing the daffodils, your precious daffodils, my precious daffodils, my only possession at 15. The only thing I didn't have to share, not knowing what was fluttering, what was dancing, but never in my, but never mind. Whatever they must have been, they must have been magical, enchanting even, because they too put a smile on my face. Whenever I lie on my mat, oft in pensive mood, trying to find some bliss of solitude now and then without the dogs, the roosters, the ayenga, my Ayenga, the village, my village, the district, my district, the neighbours, the neighbours radio, their TV, their big mouth auntie who swears at the kids because they haven't started sukkah and it's already five o'clock in the evening. God, I hated that woman, but smile at her anyway. The only way for us to watch days of our lives do you know what I mean, Mr. Wordsworth? 
Do you know what I mean? And then here is the extract um, from Dorothy Wordsworth's journals. So Dorothy was a naturalist and walker, hiker. She'd write letters on the top of the fells and the hills. And she had an incredible depth of knowledge about the natural world. And she would often go walking with her brother, William Wordsworth, and with Samuel Taylor Coleridge and other of the romantics that visited. And William Wordsworth has credited her with many of his poems because it was her notebooks that he would draw inspiration from. And she would make her own notebooks and I got to see them last year. And you can see that she wrote in pencil and she also saved up the rainwater and the oak galls and made ink. But you see her writing scrawling off. It's so different when she writes outside. And so here's the kind of inspiration for William Wordsworth's poem, The Daffodils. And at last, under the boughs of the trees, we saw that there was a long belt of daffodils along the shore, about the breadth of a country turnpike road. I never saw daffodils so beautiful. They grew among the mossy stones about and about them. Some rested their heads upon these stones as on a pillow for weariness and the rest tossed and reeled and danced and seemed as if they verily laughed with the wind that blew upon them over the lake. They looked so gay, ever glancing, ever changing. This wind blew directly over the lake to them. There was here and there a little knot and a few stragglers a few yards higher up but they were so few as not to disturb. So what I'd like us to do now is just to list a few things that we associate with this spring specifically. And what comes to mind for me is the magnolias this year that got burnt by the frost and they look like toasted marshmallows. And then also the global pandemic going on around us and rising cases in India. And um, also yesterday I was looking at a plants, new shoots, and they were like um, snails antennae, these new shoots it was putting out. So I want you to list things that are really specific to your experience of this spring. Uh, anything that comes to mind, it can be a feeling, something you've done, something you've seen, something you've smelt, but just write a few down.
So hopefully you'll have a few things and we're going to expand on this. Um, so don't worry too much if you just kind of started thinking of things because we're going to do a bit more of a longer writing exercise in a moment so that you have time to really go into it. I was just reading um, your flirty and rage and grief from the previous exercise. And I love the idea of raging in the cherry blossoms, but also the, the, the winter we're still coming out of. And, you know, it's been a time of, of grief and loss and fear. And, um, you know, it's been a difficult time. So the contrast of having that feeling in the spring makes it, it all the more powerful somehow when you when you read about it. And it also made me think of, um, I actually don't like the trees coming back into leaf because I miss seeing the birds. I love winter trees because I can see the birds, I can see their nests, and then they're all hidden from me once the leaves come back in. So I actually feel sad when I see the leaves come back because I know that this theater of birds and chicks is going to disappear. Alba agrees. Um, so I'm going to share a poem with you and then I'll explain what we're going to do and then we'll have um yeah and you can't see the sky Chris um we will have about 15 minutes so that you can also if you want to have a break get a drink you know I'm just aware that a lot of us now have kind of screen fatigue so we'll, we'll the next exercise we'll have 15 minutes Feel free to take a break in that time, toilet, tea, stretch, whatever you feel. So I'll share the poem now. So this poem is called Spring and it's by Alice Ostriker. Spring. The optimists among us, taking heart because it is spring, skip along, attending their meetings, signing their email petitions, marching with their satiric signs, singing their we shall overcome songs, posting their pungent Twitters and blogs, believing in a better world for no good reason. I envy them, said the old woman. The seasons go around. They go around and around, said the tulip, dancing among her friends in their brown bed in the sun, in the April breeze, under a maple canopy that was also dancing only with great emotions, casting greater shadows, and the grass hardly stirring. What a concerto of good stinks, said the dog, trotting along Riverside Drive in the early spring afternoon, sniffing this way and that, how gratifying the cellos of the river the tubers of the traffic, the trombones of the leafing elms with the legato of my rival's piss at their feet and the leftover meat and grease singing along in all the waste baskets. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to think of a person, to think of an animal or an insect, and to think of something non-human. It could be a plant, it could be a tree, it could be whatever you want it to be. And I'd like you to let the person speak, the animal, speak and the non-human speak 
It could even be the soil with all the roots growing through it. Go wherever you want with this. And what I'd suggest is that you do it in the same way that Alice has done with this poem, where you have separate stanzas for each point of view. And what delights me in this poem is the quite grumpy um, first view. Well, not grumpy, but just the, com the conflict and contrast like we did with the, the previous writing exercise. And then the tulips and the motion, it's almost like a dance or a choreo or choreography. And then the delight of the dog with the urine and the greasy takeaways that have been thrown that, you know, we might go, oh, no, there's rubbish. But to the dog, it's the best day ever. Um, so I'm going to give us 15 minutes to do this and then we'll come back together um, at about five to three kind of time. Um, yeah, about five minutes to three, we'll come back um, and have fun with it.
So I've just put in the chat um, the poems that we've looked at so far. But if you would like me to send you the poems, you can email me and I've put my email there. It's amrselby at gmail.com and I'll be more than happy to send the poems um, to you. And I can even send the poems from previous workshops as well so that you have them all because it is nice to refer back and it just reminds you of, of certain things. So I hope you're feeling refreshed. Um, I don't know about you, but I find it quite tiring when you're kind of trying to do lots of bursts of writing. So, you know, just be gentle with yourselves and don't put too much pressure on. Um, and um, as I said, we'll just make beginnings today. Shoots, you might have something that glints and you think, oh, I'm going to come back to that or you might have a gem you know sometimes when we work in a pressure cooker suddenly we surprise ourselves um so what i want us to do now is um two so we'll need pens again or you can do it on screen i want you to think of something disgusting, absolutely revolting, something that you, ugh, you just find gross. I want you to write that down or many things. Yeah, no worries, Albert. So um, I'll just recap for some of the people who've just come back. I want you to think of something really disgusting that you hate, something revolting, gross, that makes you feel sick or that scares you or creeps you out. And I want you to write that down. Once you've written that down, I want you to write down something that you find really distasteful or annoying. Something that really gets on your nerves. And then the last thing, just write down something you don't like, just something you don't really like. Might be gherkins. And then um, I'm going to share a poem with you. And 
it's almost like the Grinch of spring. And it's like the kind of bar humbug of, of Christmas, but for springtime. And then we're going to do something together. Um, so I'm going to share this poem with you by Edna St. Vincent Millay, um, which is called Spring. So here it is. Spring. To what purpose, April, do you return again? Beauty is not enough. You can no longer quiet me with the redness of little leaves opening stickily. I know what I know. The sun is hot on my cheek, on my neck, as I observe the spikes of the crocus. The smell of the earth is good. It is apparent that there is no death. But what does this signify? Not only underground are the brains of men eaten by maggots. Life in itself is nothing. An empty cup, a flight of uncarpeted stairs. It is not enough that yearly down this hill, April comes like an idiot, babbling and strewing flowers. So what I want you to do now is with one of, I want you to write April comes like Anne or April comes like A, and then choose one of the things, disgusting, annoying, and claim that that is what April comes like. And when you've chosen one, if you could please type in the chat, April comes like, and then whatever you've chosen. April comes like dog shit. April comes like rudeness. April comes like a slug. April comes like a sense of entitlement. Love that. April comes like a liar getting the top job. April comes like smelly festival toilets. April comes like TV adverts. April comes like a wheeled suitcase. April comes like cat poo in the veg bed. April comes like a trapped fly. I'm just going to scroll back up. Here we are. April comes like the house next door burning down last week. Oh. April comes like a trapped fly. April comes like a windowless room. April comes like slime mold. April comes like vomit. April comes like the smell of a carcass. April comes like, un like unwarranted theory. April comes like a room with the lights left on. Wonderful. April comes like people polluting the air we share. April comes like Linda Blair walking backwards down the stairs, staring red and wide eyed at me. Brilliant. April comes like maggots on my doormat. April comes like seven pounds 55 an hour work contract. April comes like chewing gum stuck to the road. Absolutely brilliant. And uh, I hope I didn't miss anyone. Sorry. If, oh, here we are. April comes like raw tomatoes without bread. I just absolutely love those. April comes like petty small talk. Just immediately from these lines, 
like with this petty small talk, I see the leaves all kind of bursting and jostling for space. And um, yeah, incredible and poignant as well at times and stark. And all the things that you've written have an amazing realness to them. And they're surprising. You know, it, it isn't what, it isn't what I expect from some writing about spring. And um, I think there's two things here. There's the kind of delight in being grumpy and going, no, I don't care that the sun's shining. I'm going to do my own thing. And what, you're, what you guys just reminded me of is when you've had an argument with someone, be it family, partner, friend, and whatever they do annoys you. You know, they could just be eating, but it annoys you how they're eating or... And that's what you've captured, that kind of burst of energy that comes in frustration and the reality of our lives and, you know, zero hour contracts and dog shit everywhere. And with so many things bursting in spring, we also spill out and burst out and also some unwanted things come. I have lots of ants and mice at the moment, you know, things come out of hibernation and wake up. And the next exercise we're going to do is, it's about hibernation, about things waking up. And I'll share this poem with you. And it's a poem by Mary Oliver. And then we'll have a think about what we will choose as our subject. So here is Mary Oliver, Spring. And here is the serpent again, dragging himself out from his nest of darkness, his cave under the black rocks, his winter death. He slides over the pine needles, he loops around the bunches of rising grass, looking for the sun. Well, oh, sorry, everyone. Let me just scroll back down. Well, who doesn't want the sun after the long winter? I step aside. He feels the air with his soft tongue. Around the bones of his body, he moves like oil. Downhill he goes, toward the black mirrors of the pond. Last night, it was still so cold. I woke and went out to stand in the yard and there was no moon. So I just stood there, inside the jaw of nothing. An owl cried in the distance. I thought of Jesus, how he crouched in the dark for two nights, then floated back above the horizon. So what I'd like you to think about is Either the night in spring, the darkness, the cold, frosty mornings, and to think of the different creatures who are waking up now. And, you know, we have badgers emerging after their hibernation. We have bees that live under the ground. The bats have come back. These aren't necessarily the animals that we think of when we think of spring, but they're also reawakening and the ants. And um, also we have at this moment, some birds, migratory birds, which are called the spring bringers, the cuckoo, red start, swift swallows, making their way um, back to the UK. 
And so what I'd like you to do with this piece of writing is think of like the slow emergence of, of waking and imagine yourself waking after sleeping for months and uh, you could be any, it could be any creature from around the world, could be a bear. Um, but just to, just to kind of describe that emergence from hibernation. And we'll have, have about um, eight minutes to do this.
And then if you can just um, finish what you're writing at the moment. And I'd love um, to see what animals or creatures you chose, if you chose one, if you want to, you can put that in the chat. Slugs, lizards, swallow, daffodils, frogs, a mouse, wonderful, a bear, turtle, hedgehog, a badger, a bear, lovely, a bat, great. I've got a bat detection, I've been listening to them, bear. Yeah, wouldn't it be wonderful? To, I just feel like the heaviness of the bear low on the ground. Yeah, wonderful. And, oh, brilliant, Christine. The human animals emerging from COVID. Ants. Yeah. Ants are absolutely incredible. I encourage you to to look up ants because they are just unbelievably amazing. Um, I want to, I'm going to finish with a few blossom poems because, oh, Doina did the root of a tree because I feel I can't not ignore the blossoms. Um, but what I want to say to you all is thank you, firstly, for coming along and giving yourselves this time. But also we've done very different exercises. So for you to, to, to swift and swerve into so many different kind of ways of thinking, ways of seeing in very short time frames is, is really miraculous. Um, and with the chat, if you want to save it, um, you can click, there's three dots at the bottom. And if you click that, you can save the chat. And as I said, feel free to email me if you'd like copies of the poems. And I'll just finish with three blossom poems. Um, so Sarah's just asked if the previous two sessions will be um, repeated. Um, I'm not sure is the honest answer, but um, next month from the 17th to the 21st of May, I'm going to be at Dartington as part of a course running some workshops. And it's a course with Nick Hayes called No Wonder and Duncan Passmore is in it as well. And it's about connecting quite deeply with nature and um, exploring printmaking, writing, creativity, um, so if any of you are in the area or are free, then there's still some spaces for that. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll do more in the future, but I'm just going to read you these blossom poems. Um, I'm not sure if any more workshops will be online, but I'll check with Dartington and if they are, you know, we can we can email you and let you know. Um, so here are three blossom poems. In a station of the metro. The apparition of these faces in the crowd. Petals. On a wet black bough. And that was by Ezra Pound. And this next poem is a Japanese poem by Kobayashi Issa. It's New Year's at the corner of the village. Ume blossoms. And then this is the last one. In the time of blossoms. Ash tree, 
sacred to her who sails in from the one sea. All over you, you leaf skeletons, fine as sparrow bones, stream out motionless on white heaven, staves of one unbreathed music. Sing to me. So thank you all so, so much. And I hope you have gorgeous weekends and um, that you have a little rest after all this writing. And I'm just going to play us out with a film of blossoms in Japan, of cherry blossoms in Japan.